Uh, welcome, everybody, to the House Transportation Finance and Policy Committee for this Thursday, January 14th, 2021. Uh, my name is Frank Hornstein, State Representative from Minneapolis, and I will be uh, chairing the meeting today. Um, I just have a couple of uh, housekeeping items just before we get started. Um, uh, I want to remind members and participants that uh, House Public Information uh, recommends uh, not trying to follow the broadcast while uh, uh, the Zoom hearing is live. Uh, there's a lag between the live Zoom feed and the broadcast. Uh, if members have questions or would like to be recognized, uh, please uh, ask uh, these by using the raise hand feature, uh, which is located either in the participant option or the uh, reactions option at the bottom of your Zoom screen, depending on which version of Zoom. Uh, that you have. Uh, and uh, if those options aren't working, um, please email our committee staff, John Howard, Dan Dodge, and they will pass on to me that uh, you have a, a question. Um, so uh, I want to just, uh, uh, we have a couple of housekeeping, again, business items. Um, and um, I would like to uh, uh, have our uh, committee legislative assistant, Dan Dodge, uh, take the role so that we can establish a quorum uh, and he will call individual members' names. You simply will say present after your name is called. Uh, anyone who is late, uh, we will uh, keep the role open for members to check in and, and be recorded as present at the meeting. So with that, Mr. Dodge. Chair Hornstein. Present. Hornstein present. Vice Chair Cagle. Present. Cagle present. Uh, Representative Petersburg. Present. Petersburg present. Representative Barr. Present. Barr present. Representative Bernardi. Present. Bernardi present. Representative Elkins. Elkins present. Elkins present. Representative Fre Frederick. Present. Representative Frederick present. Representative Houseman. Present. Houseman present. Representative Heinrich. Heinrich present. Heinrich present. Representative Kosnick. Representative Kosnick. Representative Mason. Present. Mason present. Representative Murphy. Murphy present. Murphy present. Representative Nelson. Nelson present. Nelson present. Representative Olson. Present. Olson present. Representative Richardson. Representative Richardson. Representative Torkelson. Torkelson present. Torkel Torkelson present. Representative West. Here. West present. There is a quorum. Um, thank you, Mr. Dodge. Um, and so our next item of business is to approve the minutes uh, from the uh, last meeting. I've, uh, I believe that Representative Petersburg has had a chance to uh, inspect those minutes. Um, uh, Representative Petersburg, uh, do you have a motion? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the adoption of the minutes of the January 12th meeting. Uh, thank you, Representative Petersburg. Uh, any discussion? Uh, this will be a voice vote. Uh, all those in favor of approval of the minutes signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? The motion carries. Thank you, members. Um, before we get started here, I just wanted to make a couple of brief comments, and I'll call on um, uh, Representative Petersburg as well uh, in his capacity, uh, both as the uh, uh, lead uh, for uh, the uh, Republican caucus, but also as a member of the, uh, or the, the a board member of the Center for Transportation Studies. Uh, members, I um, felt it was very important for us to kick off our formal hearings uh, for this uh, year uh, with a couple of days of presentations from the Center for Transportation Studies at the University of Minnesota. I felt uh, particularly uh, in this moment, uh, this very uh, difficult and challenging moment for all of us, and particularly uh, in the transportation sector due to COVID, that uh, we acknowledge that reality of COVID, uh, how it is changing and uh, how we need to change and adapt with 
whatever new normal emerges and, and whatever continued challenges this crisis uh, uh, is uh, engendering uh, for transportation, uh, that we, we start again with some of the best thinkers in the state of Minnesota and even nationally. We have someone joining us uh, today from Davis, California, University of California, Davis, to hear what they think, uh, hear what they're studying, hear what their analysis, their thoughts, their advice for us as we move forward. Uh, issues such as uh, connected and automated vehicles, supply chain, uh, transit, equity, climate, um, uh, the, the economy, the, the economic implications of this crisis. These are all on the table for us to be examined in the next couple of days and really throughout uh, the coming legislative session. And I'll just simply conclude my opening comments by saying that uh, I think we've all learned uh, during this time of this this un this unprecedented uh, uh, pandemic uh, in, in our modern era, uh, how critical transportation is to all of us. Uh, it is, after all, the transportation supply chain that has kept us afloat. It is the frontline transportation workers, uh, whether they're UPS drivers or pilots or um, uh, transit operators, uh, uh, those that work in warehouses, the, the, the entire supply chain as it relates to transportation has literally kept our society afloat. And uh, again, I think about the railroads and the railroad workers and the truckers. Um, this has been so essential to, to our survival, quite frankly, uh, over these last uh, 10 months, it's now been 10 months. And um, you know, when I saw the images on uh, television of the vaccine being rolled out, uh, it was trucks leaving warehouses and, and planes arriving uh, with that uh, needed life-saving vaccine. Uh, it's the transportation infrastructure uh, that was featured in those news reports. So I wanted to sort of frame our conversation today with those thoughts, and I, I wanna pass it over to Representative Petersburg for his thoughts and uh, also I want to thank him for his involvement with the Center for Transportation Studies as a leader and a board member of that very important organization that, that we're indebted to for our next couple of hearings. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I will you know, echo your, your insight in regards to transportation. You know, as we stay at home and so forth, uh, we can get information back and forth online, but so far we haven't been able to figure out how to beam stuff back and forth to us. So we are still, uh, that's a trick, connection there. But so we are still dependent upon our transportation system for all the things that we're purchasing and so forth. So we need to keep that in mind, uh, whether we're after COVID or not, it's, it's important. Uh, and you are correct. I think uh, for the last five or six years, I've had the privilege to be on the board of the Center of Transportation Studies through the Humphrey Institute here at the University of Minnesota. And we have some of the um, some of our talented people there, uh, students uh, and, and faculty, working on the cutting edge of study of transportation, transportation systems. Uh, I also have to always remind myself, and I'll remind us here too, that sometimes the outcomes of what we perceive as theoretical uh, application of some of the things that we think about and the real world application is sometimes uh, doesn't follow the same thing. So. We need to kind of keep in mind that sometimes the world doesn't always work like the theoretical world uh, of academia. But at the same time, uh, we have the availability of the data and research from the great institution that we have here in Minnesota and the uh, Center for Transportation Studies to help us at least give us an idea of where we start from. And to me, I think that is one of the most valuable tools that we have available for us. And I hope we can um, sometime in the future maybe go visit them at the University of Minnesota campus. Uh, but uh, I think you'll look forward to hearing some of the information that they have and uh, may even raise more questions than what we perceive of it at this particular point. So with that, Mr. Chair, I think we, I'll turn it back to you. Well, thank you very much, Representative Petersburg, for those comments and uh, you know your work again with the center is very appreciated. Um, we will now call on um, uh, Ms. Uh, Gina Bass, uh, who um, is the Associate Director of the Center for Transportation Studies at the University of Minnesota, uh, for some brief opening comments. 
Thank you, Chair Hornstein, Representative Petersburg, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. My organization, the Center for Transportation Studies, is the focal point for transportation research, workforce development, and engagement at the University of Minnesota. Our priority is to address Minnesota's transportation challenges and opportunities, while also striving to have national and global impact. CTS works with faculty and researchers in more than 30 colleges and departments throughout the university's system, including the Duluth and Morris campuses. At any given time, there are well over 100 active transportation research projects being conducted by these researchers and their students. Our roles at CTS are to support research by matching funders who have research needs with experts at the university, to translate and disseminate research results, to help university students prepare to enter the workforce, to provide new knowledge and best practices for today's practitioners, and to convene and engage stakeholders and the public around transportation issues and topics. It is the role of engagement that brings us here today. Chair Hornstein has asked the faculty and researchers speaking during this hearing and next Tuesday to share their insights and thoughts about what our transportation future will look like. They will also discuss the impacts of the pandemic, which have in some cases accelerated and in other cases delayed innovation and transformation in the transportation industry. Our intent is to spark discussion and information exchange as you all prepare for the legislative session ahead. And for the university, it could lead to new, re new research ideas and priorities. Topics covered today will include pandemic impacts on modes of transportation, advancing equity in transportation, shared modes and services, and the role of data in supporting transportation decision-making. Next Tuesday, you will hear about vehicle advancements, including connected and automated vehicles and vehicle electrification, remote work and its impact on transportation, freight and supply chain advancements, and transportation finance and revenue strategies. Beyond these hearings, CTS and the network of experts with whom we work are resources for all of you. We are ready to be of assistance by providing information and answering questions on transportation related topics as they arise. Thank you and I turn things back to Chair Hornstein. Thank you, Ms. Bass. And uh, again, our appreciation for your help and, and uh, getting us started and, and, uh, and your suggestions for um, uh, faculty and, and topics to discuss. Uh, our first speaker uh, is actually uh, not uh, joining us from Minnesota, but from Davis, California. Uh, his name is Dr. Giovanni Cercella, and he is the director of the Three Revolutions Future Mobility Program at the Institute for Transportation Studies at the University of California, Davis. And uh, Dr. Cercella, we are so pleased that you can join us. This is one of the advantages, I, I suppose, of the Zoom era is that we didn't have to, uh, to have you come in um, uh, by air or train or whatever your preferred uh, mode of transportation is. Uh, but um, uh, we are happy to have you. And as is our, our tradition uh, here, uh, we ask you to uh, please state your name and your title for our official record. And then we will hear uh, from Dr. Cercella for from for approximately 10 minutes. Uh, after that, we'll hear from Professor Yangling Fan from the Humphrey School of Public Affairs. And then we will have a, a period, a question and answer period. And then after that, uh, for those two uh, presenters, and then after that, we'll hear a couple more presenters uh, before we adjourn at 2.30. So with that, uh, welcome to the committee, Dr. Cercella. Thank you so much for joining us. And welcome to the committee. Thank you, Chair Ornstein. Uh, good, mo good morning or good afternoon in Minnesota, everybody. And uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, Representative Petersburg and members of the committee and everybody. My name is Giovanni Circella. I'm the director of the Three Revolutions Future Mobility Program at the Institute of Transportation Studies of the University of California, Davis. And it is uh, my honor to be uh, invited today to give some brief uh, uh, summary uh, thoughts about our research on investigating the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on transportation. You can proceed. Thank you very much, doctor. Uh, 
I believe I'm able to share my screen, so I will try to do it right now. Hopefully you can see my screen right now. Perfect. So uh, at our group uh, at the uh, University of California Davis, uh, we will launch a pretty large uh, uh, research program in which we are now investigating the temporary versus longer term impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on mobility. And to give uh, uh, some uh, in summary thoughts uh, uh, on the impacts that the pandemic has brought to transportation, in this slide on the left, you can see the changes uh, reported in walking, driving, and transit movements uh, in Minneapolis, actually, in Minnesota. And uh, uh, the trends that we have been seeing in uh, major areas of Minneapolis, St. Paul, or other parts of the country have been rather similar. During the pandemic, uh, uh, transportation has been heavily disrupted. Uh, in particular, at the beginning of the pandemic, we have seen a big reduction in the use of all modes of transportation, with a steep decline in air travel, steep decline in use of public transportation, shared mobility. We had the suspension of pool rides like uh, Uber pool or Lyft share in the cities where these services were available. And we saw big reductions in vehicle mass travel and greenhouse gas emissions from transportation. This was also coupled with uh, large increases in the adoption of teleworking among many segments of the population, devastating impacts on the employment, but also as the pandemic evolved, we have seen that uh, the car travel in particular has recovered much faster than the use of other modes, posing somehow challenges also for the transportation system in the following months uh, uh, as the pandemic evolved. Uh, at the University of California Davis, we will launch a large research project in which we are investigating both the temporary and longer term impacts of the pandemic. We have a targeted data collection focusing in particular on 15 large metro regions of the United States and two regions in Canada. And so far we have collected information for more than 11,000 uh, travelers that have completed our data collection with our uh, surveys. And one of the key uh, aspects of this project is that we have uh, the ability to have a longitudinal data. So for a part of our sample, we have data from before the pandemic in 2018, 2019. We have had a first round of data collection during the spring 2020, data collection during the first wave of the pandemic. We had another round of data collection we just completed in fall 2020, and we will continue to collect additional rounds of data collection in spring 2021 and beyond. I will not have the time today to discuss all the details about our research, but for all interested, I recommend that you can check additional information available at the website postcovid19mobility.ucdavis.edu. In the remaining time available in my uh, uh, presentation today, I will just touch a few topics. I will start talking about uh, the uh, impact that the pandemic had on specific segments of the population. When we look in our survey data, and this confirms also uh, data from other sources, uh, uh, lower income uh, households were uh, affected much uh, more stronger than other groups in the population. Not only individuals in lower income households were more likely to report that they are financially struggling, but also lower income workers uh, uh, somehow the, uh, were additionally affected by the pandemic. So building already in a situation in which uh, their situation was weaker. And they are more likely to have reported that they've been furloughed without pay than higher income category workers. They are more likely to have lost their job during the pandemic or they are more likely to uh, work, used to work in uh, places of employment that have ran out of business. Also, lower income workers are more likely to be considered essential workers. And in many cases, they had to continue to physically commute to work also during the pandemic with all the risks that this uh, uh, causes also for the potential exposure to the virus. Um, when we look at the adoption of telecommuting, uh, certainly there's been a big increase in remote working and the adoption of telecommuting during the uh, all stages of the pandemic, in particular during spring 2020. Uh, many households has also made important home improvements. Uh, these include setting up a home offices, uh, purchasing new software, hardware, upgrading their internet connection. And these are changes that might actually encourage the continuation of at least uh, partially remote uh, working with some partial forms of telecommuting uh, beyond the end of the pandemic, we believe. Uh, also, the uh, reported uh, number of days telecommuting was very, very different between uh, different uh, uh, groups. 
So in this data, we have been analyzing the uh, a portion of the longitudinal data. So uh, for which we have data uh, for this group of users, so data from before the pandemic and during the pandemic. And we can see a big uptick in the use of telecommuting among higher income workers and white collar office workers. This was not the case for lower income workers. About approximately 46% of low income respondents in our sample has never telecommuted also during the pandemic. And pretty much there was a much lower uh, increase of telecommuting in these groups during the pandemic. When we look at uh, about another form of uh, information communication technology enabled uh, form of uh, uh, activity, e-shopping, we see that uh, the pandemic has actually produced a sharp increase in uh, e-shopping with some interesting impact. Uh, one of these is uh, the democratization of e-shopping. So we have seen our data confirm that uh, we have seen an increased adoption of e-shopping also among broader segments of the population beyond the early adopters that were already using e-shopping already before the pandemic. This means that also elderly population and those also in particular concerned about the health impacts of the pandemic has started using e-shopping more. This means that e-shopping has increased the user base. We still see low income households lagging behind, however, and this is something important to consider for equity consideration. This has had huge impacts on the uh, good movement with the delivery of products that we certainly can see in all our cities. And also we can say that the pandemic somehow has accelerated an existing trend that was already there in the growth of shopping in society, which might likely become also like in a more permanent change in society. Somehow there was an acceleration of an existing trend. I also want to point to another type of service that is enabled by technology, which is the use of food delivery apps. Food delivery apps like services like Uber Eats, for example, has seen a higher adoption among younger urban dynamic segments of the population during the pandemic. There was a sharp increase in food delivery, but it was also highly correlated with the same respondents in our study that have reduced their restaurant visits. So for this portion of the adoption of technology, we believe that there is at least in part the possibility that after the pandemic, there will be some reversal of this trend when patrons return to restaurant and might use these services less. So some differences between the two types of services. I want to touch a topic related to transportation and car dependence in particular. A large portion of survey respondents in our study show an increased interest in purchasing additional vehicles in the household. This is particularly true among lower income households and those that live without a car today. And so this also matches somehow the uh, sales data that we see from car dealers during 2020, in which there was a sharp reduction in vehicle sales at the beginning of the pandemic, but then actually the market rebounced. And we see also a reduction in attitudes toward living without a car or living in forms of car light lifestyles. And so from 2018 and 2019, our data show a pretty large reduction. It was already a niche phenomenon, individuals that want to live with few cars or with no cars in urban areas, but it's shrinking during 2020. A big question is what will happen after the pandemic? But so right now, this is pointing to increase, potential increased car dependence of society. A couple of points which are important to mention, equity issues. I already talked about how the pandemic has affected a lot of the lower income categories and this should be considered in policies. But also I want to mention traffic congestion and environmental impacts. Discretionary trips often made by car are at least partially compensating for the reduced volume of commuting trips during the pandemic. And our survey data are also showing that a considerable portion of those that have reduced the use of transit now they are driving more. So this combined with increased car sales and increased interest in buying a car might point to increased car dependence in the future. And this also uh, sum up to another phenomenon that has been the substitution of airplane trips with the longer distance car travel trips that might actually contribute in the future to increase traffic congestion after the temporary reduction. And then big question remain associated with trust, transit revenues because there has been a big reduction in transit revenues and there is the possibility that this might affect service in the future. I will uh, uh, kind of leave with three other thoughts to consider. We need to consider that apart from demand, supply is changing quickly. 
The pandemic has uh, accelerated the process of mergers and acquisitions. We have seen this in the share mobility sector, for instance, with the merger of the jump division of Uber and Lime. This will certainly affect demand in the share mobility, airline sector, many other areas. Also, cities have been promoting the conversion of car space for other uses, and there is uh, potential for policies to promote these for more permanent changes. And this includes also uh, increased infrastructure for bicyclists that has been promoted in many areas as a car traffic congestion management uh, uh, policy. And this is uh, often developed on a temporary basis, but it could become more permanent for some policies uh, at the local level. And so a big question with which I will leave this uh, uh, presentation is uh, after the pandemic, we will go back to the, our previous life. The scientific leisure, literature points that usually after a large disruption, individuals tend to go back to their previous behaviors. However, the longer the disruption, the more likely that some permanent effects will remain. I would suggest that telecommuting is likely, likely to remain at least partial telecommuting in some levels in between the low level before the pandemic. In Minnesota, it was about 5% of individuals on a, a, any day would work from home. In between that level from before the pandemic and somehow the highest level during the pandemic. So the future will be somewhere in between most likely. Also, some of the increases that we saw in e shopping will likely persist as the pandemic has somehow accelerated the trend that was already there. And also, we need to consider that the retail space will likely be changed forever as many shops are running out of business and will likely not come back anymore because this business model is not uh, anymore surviving in the new reality. And then also, there will be a long transition because an economic activities will need time to recover. We have longitudinal data and a lot of our focus in the research communities to really try to study this topic and understand how much of the temporary changes might translate in longer term impacts on society. Thank you very much for additional information I'm available to answer questions. And also I could be contacted after the meeting for any clarification and information on our work. Um, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Sercella. That was an excellent introduction that really framed so many of the uh, issues that we would like to talk about, not only the next over the next couple of days, but really throughout the session. Uh, members, our, our format today, um, we will move now to our next uh, speaker, Dr. Uh, Yingling Fan from uh, the uh, uh, Humphrey School here in Minneapolis. Dr. Fan will give a presentation uh, on transit and equity, which I think you teed up quite uh, effectively, Dr. Sercella. And then we'll take, we'll have time for maybe one or two member questions for after uh, Dr. Fan's uh, presentation um, uh, for her and Dr. Sercella. And then we'll move on uh, quickly to our next panel so we can get everything in by 2.30. And members, if you have questions, uh, and this committee is, uh, very good and active in that regard, and you can't get your question asked today uh, in the context of our meeting. Uh, we uh, All of our speakers, uh, both today and on Tuesday, next Tuesday, have generously agreed to uh, answer your questions uh, briefly in writing if you pose them, and we can post them on our Transportation Committee website as well. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Yingling Fan, our next um, speaker, and she uh, is uh, from the Humphrey School uh, here in Minneapolis, and she has uh, a number of different specialties uh, among them, the relationship between transportation and health and equity and land use. Uh, uh, she has also expertise in transit systems, and we'll focus on some of the equity issues that we need to be addressing uh, both currently and moving forward. Uh, Dr. Fans, welcome to the committee and please state your name uh, for our record. Thank you, Chair Hoinstein, and thank you, members of the committee. My name is Yingling Fan. I'm a professor of urban and regional planning at Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. It is my honor to share with you some of our recent research. And with that, I'm going to share my screen here. The 
the presentation, uh, the title of my presentation is a multimodal future of transportation equity. Uh, Dr. Sachella really uh, laid out the ground, uh, the foundation, and I'm going to take a deeper dive to talk about uh, uh, why it is important that we look into equity implications of our future transportation decisions as well as investment, and uh, why it is so important that uh, we pursue a multimodal future of transportation. I wanted to start my presentation with a, a you know, kind of story of my personal experience. When I did the field work in uh, 16 large uh, metropolitan areas in the United States back in 2016, uh, where uh, I visited the 16 uh, metropolitan areas across the United States, and the one particular metropolitan area I visited uh, was uh, Dallas, Texas. And I also visited Arlington, which is a suburban city uh, next to uh, Dallas, Texas. Uh, so just for your information, Arlington is a very unique city if you study transportation because uh, Arlington is the largest, pop, uh, largest city uh, in terms of population size without having any public transportation system until 2013. And by the time that I visited the city in 2016, uh, it has a very limited uh, public transportation system with uh, two bus routes. Um, and uh, Arlington is actually uh, uh, the, uh, the sixth largest city in the state of Texas, just for information in terms of population size. Um, and uh, my experience is that when I visited the city hall and I entered the city hall through the sidewalk, and immediately I didn't feel a sense of welcome because uh, as I entered the city hall from the front door, actually the sculpture seems to be purposefully uh, uh, positioned to, uh, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm the sculpture wasn't faced uh, before me, but actually the back of the sculpture uh, faced me as I was entering through the front door. Um, so I was very intrigued by this. Uh, you know, it seems that the sculpture is positioned purposefully uh, towards the back door, and I later realized it's toward because that uh, uh, most people are actually coming from the back door uh, from the parking lot. Um, so this is a, a very, you know, this is just a tip of iceberg, you know, telling you about uh, kind of the type of experience that when we adopt the uh, car as the default transportation mode, that people who either could not afford uh, cars or couldn't operate cars, right? This, uh, people with disabilities and elderly, uh, increasing elderly population, um, you know, their experience with the city when we designed the city, uh, you know, uh, considering car as the uh, default transportation mode. Um, so automobile dependence to some degree actually creates a, a underclass uh, for our society. And uh, Dr. Sachala actually uh, uh, talked already about that uh, how transit ridership has been significantly reduced uh, post the pandemic. Um, and in uh, the city of Minneapolis, we have seen that transit ridership down about uh, four, uh, 60%. But if we dig deeper and look at, you know, during pandemic, who are the people actually uh, take transit? So we find out that uh, transportation inequities actually uh, have been, ex exacerbated by uh, the pandemic. And as you can see that certainly that if you look at by race, that the, um, the percentage of white population among transit riders have dropped significantly. But if you look at a percentage of uh, minority uh, riders, riders in minority race or ethnicity, you can see that it's actually increased uh, 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 after the uh, during the post-pandemic era. In addition, if we look at uh, uh, income categories uh, as well as uh, uh, the worker category, like in which sector that uh, people use the public transportation for commute, you can see that uh, clearly that uh, people riding uh, uh, public transportation during post-pandemic era are largely low income and the essential workers. Um, we also at the university and at Humphrey School, we also did a lot of uh, uh, community engagement efforts and ask people directly, what do you think will be your preferred transportation mode for the future? Again, this is uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the, a lot of the engagement actually occurred prior to the pandemic. Uh, so our results, I mean, if we are doing uh, the uh, same community engagement that uh, 
uh, after the pandemic, uh, I, mean, I think the results might be a little bit different. But um, you know, the uh, communities overwhelmingly told, uh, told us that uh, it's the integration of modes that are very important. And also public transportation are very important uh, when it comes to the future of transportation. And uh, we also did a lot of uh, literature review as well as a program review and, and look into like what really are uh, important when it comes to advancing uh, transportation equity. And we find out that, uh, you know, multimodal transportation system, having a multimodal transportation system, have a balanced private and transportation uh, uh, system is really important. And also we wanted to ensure that quality transportation services. So when we think about uh, private transportation versus public transportation, we know that uh, in our society that uh, our public transportation uh, system not necessarily provided the best transportation service out there. Uh, you know, in the world when compared to other developed countries or even developing countries. And I think it's also very important when it comes to advancing transportation equity that uh, we promote fair uh, decision-making process. Part of the reason that, uh, uh, you know, we designed the city using the, uh, you know, car, considering car as the default transportation mode, largely because that uh, our transportation systems, including public transportation system, are designed by people travel, uh, you know, are dependent upon cars. So people travel by cars, not necessarily are designed by people who actually take transit uh, uh, in, 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 in their lives. And uh, um, regarding the emerging uh, technologies that are shaping our transportation future, you know, either prior to uh, the pandemic or post the pandemic, I think it's a very it's a uh, it's a great timing to redefine public versus public uh, versus private transportation. So if you look at the kind of the type of uh, uh, traditional public transportation modes, so the traditional public transportation modes are described in uh, in the figure. Uh, uh, on your uh, left, and then we're looking at a kind of that uh, uh, some newly emerged uh, transportation modes and the mostly kind of shared mobility modes. There is actually opportunity uh, for innovative public-private partnership given the newly emerged transportation modes, and it's uh, uh, the timing uh, is right in terms of redefining, you know, what is public transportation because previously. Public transportation is all about the high uh, high capacity transit vehicles. But now, if you look at the uh, definition at the F Federal Transit Administration, their definition of transit vehicles uh, is now broadened to be any vehicle that provides shared passenger services. So, if you with that view, I think there is a lot to be done in terms of a public-private partnership and a redefine public transportation. And uh, with the newly emerged um, uh, transportation modes, uh, there is also opportunity in terms of addressing social isolation in urban as well as the rural areas. One of the uh, nice part about public transportation and the shared mobility and often not being talked about, you know, we talk about the environmental benefits, we talk about economic benefits, but we often don't, don't talk about that the type of places being created when we have public transportation and shared mobility, right? Um, so uh, on your right here, I have a group of pictures showing that, uh, you know, nice ride operating in Bemidji, uh, Arrowhead Transit serving rural greater Minnesota, and also that I think, uh, uh, you know, it's not implemented yet about the May uh, Mobility, which is a, a shared autonomous vehicle uh, company in uh, Michigan, and they are considering doing some uh, pilot uh, uh, work in uh, Grand Rapids, Minnesota. So uh, I think it's a very important that uh, to decouple kind of like uh, public transportation and the urban environment. And uh, there is a lot that public transportation could do in the rural area serving the greater Minnesota. And uh, finally, I think this slide is just uh, to talk about it, it's very important that we have a holistic understanding of the purposes of transportation. Transportation is a mobility tool, but it's essentially it's about creating livable urban and rural communities. You know, so how can we make decisions and investments in transportation that help us to create, uh, you know, the the type of communities that we want to live in? And uh, um, I wanted to emphasize that uh, it's very important 
method that we promote a cooperative trans transportation and placemaking, uh, you know, the uh, cooperation or uh, partnership needs to happen uh, across government uh, agency levels and also across the public and the private sectors. And finally, uh, that, uh, you know, with that, uh, uh, you know, cooperative transportation and placemaking in mind, uh, you know, it's very important that, that we do integrated uh, transport and land use planning. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Fan, very much. Um, I, we have two questions. We're going to take these two questions uh, and, um, and then move on quickly to our, our two concluding uh, presentations. And again, I want to emphasize that if any members of the committee uh, aren't, aren't able to ask their questions uh, here uh, on uh, during committee time. Uh, all of our guests will be happy to answer them and we'll make your questions and their answers uh, public on our website. Our first question is from Representative Petersburg. And again, uh, you can direct it to either uh, Professor uh, Fan or uh, Professor Kutzerchella. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And this is to Dr. Fan. Uh, in regards to the, your presentation, I, I've seen a lot of that before in, in CDS committee, and, and you do a, a great job of, of providing uh, information. A couple of questions in regards to the committee that um, um, in which you talked about people have this preference. There's a difference, isn't there, between people who participate in a meeting like that and the general public and, and whether or not people that participate in those type meetings will have a different sense of what they're going to do versus the general public uh, for one question. And the other one is in regards to especially rural Minnesota, there's a difference between ability to do uh, shared travel uh, locally versus regionally versus statewide. And that makes kind of differences and impacts as well. So I'm glad that you talked about that there's differences between rural Minnesota and, and uh, metro area as well. But if you could expound upon those, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Professor Fan. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Petersburg, for uh, your question. Regarding your first question, I need a, a little bit uh, 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 clarification. So, when you're referring that to people in the meeting, are you referring that to people generally, uh, you know, making transportation decisions, or what do you, which, which group of people you are referring to? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, Representative Petersburg. Uh, yeah, you had talked about a meeting in which you had, in which you asked them. What they, what they thought over the next five years would be their preferred method of transportation. And you had a listing of that. And I was just indicating that people who are engaged in transportation issues may have a different take on it than what the average person who is dealing with transportation issues might be. And how do we break that down so that we have comparative realities? Professor Fan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, uh, Representative of Petersburg. Uh, yes, you are correct. So the P the kind of community engagement activities we do, uh, you know, we needed to make sure that they are representative of the uh, uh, diverse population that. Uh, uh, you know, that we consider as the public. Um, I have to, uh, you know, I, I think I'm not just uh, kind of cherry picking the information. So we actually also did the survey among uh, ABC ramps users. So the uh, ABC ramp users are the people who are, uh, who are uh, you know, I would say that uh, uh, car dependent and that they, their primary mode to, um, you know, uh, their primary transportation mode is driving. So we did ask them, what is your ideal transportation mode? Uh, you know, is uh, commuting to work by car your ideal transportation mode? And in fact, uh, you know, uh, over 60% of the drivers, the car drivers, suggested that, that car driving uh, to, you know, is not their ideal commute mode. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and uh, we're going to have Representative Bernardi and Representative Cagle, but very briefly, uh, and then brief answers so we can get to our next uh, panel. Representative Bernardi. Oh, shucks. OK, so I'll, I'll say uh, both questions, and then we just see what we can get through quickly. So two questions. One is um, what was talked about urban and rural. And I'm just wondering what the studies are being done about the suburbs because they have di they have different transportation experiences and the built environment is built differently. And then um, my other question is when um, 
Dr. Shakar, I mean, uh, Professor Shakar, when you're talking about equity and um, uh, Professor Fan too, are you looking at like the equity as far as like, are you looking in deeper like civil rights? So like people that have disabilities or people, the BIPOC community, people who have like civil rights and you know, are you looking at those types of um, data as well? I think you meant uh, Professor Circella. Uh, oh, sh oh, shoot. I'm so sorry. I was looking at my screen wrong. Sorry. He's coming and then we want to make sure that he, he has time. So I think we're just going to take that one question, Representative Bernardi, and if either of you want to answer, okay. properly, then we'll get to Representative Kegel and move on. Uh, Representative Circella. We can, sir. Oh, sorry. Okay. Professor. <laughs> I called you or I promoted you or demoted you. Uh, <laughs> Professor Circella. Thank you so much, Representative Bernardi, for your question. Um, the equity uh, topic is very, very important. Uh, in our study, we are focusing on different type of uh, communities, in particular looking at uh, by uh, socioeconomic uh, characteristics, uh, low income communities, but also minorities. Uh, I have uh, a colleague at UC Davis that is particularly looking at uh, individuals with disabilities and impairments. And so that part of the research is also focusing on that topic. Uh, we have uh, some uh, additional part of the research with qualitative in-depth interviews that, that will focus in particular on the difficulties uh, that are facing like, you know, the individuals uh, in uh, these communities. And uh, this is also designed to in, uh, inform policy. And so if you are interested, we would be very happy to share additional results from that part of the research. Thank you. Thank you. And Representative Murray, if you had a second question, I know that, and, and write it down and we'll get it to our, our speakers and, and make sure that your questions are answered. Our last question for this segment is from Vice Chair Cagle. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I think either one of you guys could answer this, but I was just wondering if we've seen any shift in people switching from bus to Uber based, Uber Lyft type ride sharing services because of COVID. And maybe we don't have the um, information collected yet, but it would be interesting to see if people um, switched away from uh, buses to, to use more of ride sharing and um, what the income levels of, of those folks. Uh, either uh, professor want to answer that question? I already answered the previous question, but if you want, I can bring Yeah, absolutely. No, we, we want to take advantage. You're all the way here from Davis, California, so please. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Kegel, for the uh, excellent question. Um, we have uh, uh, quite a bit of data, and we have actually published uh, uh, some scientific publication uh, discussing the uh, switch from public transportation to Uber and share mobility modes before the pandemic. So I will be very happy to share those uh, uh, publications with you and that information. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, we have not uh, uh, really looked specifically at this topic, but our data, our preliminary data, actually show that uh, uh, Uber use declined more than the use of public transportation. And so pretty much like, you know, there was a decline very, very significant between the two. What we detected was a significant shift from using public transportation to driving a private car. That was very significant. I will probably need to look back in our data to see if there is anything, any shift to Uber, but if there is, it would be probably in order of magnitude much smaller. The big shift was from public transportation to either staying at home and working remotely or driving a car for those that still drive. And thank you, um, uh, Professor Circella. Uh, Dr. Fan, did you want to weigh in on, on this as well or the previous question? Yes, uh, thank you, Ms. Chair, and uh, uh, thank you, Vice, Pre uh, Vice Chair Kirkle, for the uh, question. I just wanted to add uh, uh, one, uh, you know, one thought here is that uh, uh, even in the Twin Cities um, metro area, we actually have transit agencies, uh, Southwest Transit, which is a suburban transit agency that uh, offer Uber-like services uh, to their riders. So uh, I think my point is that uh, nowadays that uh, the line between Uber and the public transportation is blurry. So there's a lot of uh, innovations as well as a public-private partnership that could occur to serve people that have needs for Uber-like services. 
So thank you uh, again to uh, the members uh, uh, for uh, your questions. And uh, again, to, to Dr. Fan and Dr. Circella, we appreciate so much your time, your, your sharing your uh, thoughts and reflections and research with us. Uh, and uh, we will pass on any additional questions to you. Uh, again, all, members, all of this material will be posted on our website, the PowerPoints, the presentations, uh, and I think we'll be referring to, to this, I think, throughout our uh, uh, coming months uh, together. So again, to, to both of you, thank you, thank you so much, and uh, we appreciate your time and uh, uh, taking time out of your busy days and schedules to, to be with us. Uh, so now we have a couple of more uh, presenters, and we'll have a similar format. Uh, uh, presentations from our guests and then uh, questions and answers and that that will take us up to 2 30. Um, uh, to lead off our next uh, section our next panel uh, is uh, Professor Saif Benjafar and uh, he is uh, coming to us as the head and uh, professor of the Department of um, Industrial Systems Engineering at the University of Minnesota. had a chance to meet him the other day he is uh, uh, wonderful and dynamic and has a lot of interesting research to share with us. Uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, please uh, state your name for the record. Uh, thank you, Chair uh, Hornstein. Uh, my name is Saif Benjafar. Um, as uh, Chair Hornstein mentioned, I am a professor in the College of Science and Engineering at the University of Minnesota, uh, where I've been there for the last 30 years and where I currently also run this initiative on the sharing economy under the, under the umbrella of uh, CTS. So I'm going to uh, share my screen here. Um, I don't know if you can see it. Yes, we're, it's working well. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I thought in the spirit of spurring discussion and debate, um, I will try to be somewhat provocative today um, with a provocative title. Uh, we like provocative. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> uh, that is nevertheless, um, I think, in the spirit of, uh, of my remarks, as you will see. So in preparing for this meeting, um, Chair Hornstein mentioned that the committee is particularly interested in, um, in uh, hearing about um, uh, the university, um, um, thinking about the future of um, uh, the future, the future of transportation, in particular post-pandemic. Uh, so, in some sense, um, uh, the future is already here. Uh, so, if you're uh, like me, you might have had a day like this one, uh, where you um, uh, maybe you woke up uh, in the morning and instead of going to the gym the gym came to you. Uh, instead of going to work, uh, the, the office came to you. If you have uh, children, instead of children going to school, the school came to them. Uh, and then after work, instead of going to the mall or to the grocery store, the mall and the grocery store came to you. Uh, and in the evening, instead of going to a restaurant with your spouse, the restaurant came to you. And instead of going to the movies, uh, the movie theater came to you. Um, so uh, for those of you who know me, most of you in the, in the year do not. Um, uh, in the last 30 years or so, I've been, I've been mostly working on developing analytics, so models, algorithms, analysis, and technology to, with colleagues and students in the College of Science and Engineering at the University of Minnesota to enable digital products and services, but also innovative business models, not unlike the ones I just mentioned here, alluded to. Uh, uh, so today I'm not gonna talk about the work, uh, but I'm gonna talk about some takeaways, some, some mega trends in the spirit of, of what uh, uh, Chair Hornstein has um, encouraged me to do. So these are mega trends and uh, my comments at, um, at the high level and perhaps somewhat speculative, so I'd also welcome the pushback. Um, uh, but uh, uh, we, I'm going to focus on four, uh, four ideas or four, four trends. Uh, the first one is the increased digitization of product services and work. The second one is the emergence of transportation-enabled services. 
The third one is the what I'm calling here the scaling of the economy, its impact on cities. And then the last one is the growth of uh, product and services on demand. So some of this has been alluded to in the previous presentations. But uh, so let me first start by uh, uh, by noting that transportation. One way to think about transportation is really a solution to uh, the spatial mismatch between where people are and where the products and services they seek are. In part driven by zoning laws, right? The, so the residential is typically separated from the commercial. The commercial is separated from the industrial. The industrial separated from uh, the recreational. And because of this, so this creates inefficiency or uh, friction uh, that then will require that people, people move around uh, in order to get the service, to have access to the products and services they seek. Uh, this friction is increasingly being addressed uh, by digitization of products and services and work, and the tele-economy, if you may, so telework, telehealth, telefitness, online learning, and so on. So instead of you trying to move around in space to access these products and services, lots of, in, in many cases, some cases, uh, these products and services are being can be beamed to you anytime, anywhere. So that's one one trend um, that's affecting um, the demand for transportation. The other trend is uh, I'm calling here transportation enabled services, uh, which is really this I, this this um, um, uh, this trend uh, the shift away from transporting people to the transporting of products and services. So online shopping, home deliveries are good examples of this, mobile clinics, mobile grocery stores and others. So instead of, um, of, of people moving in space to get access to products and services, these products physically coming to them, uh, leveraging, uh, leveraging, uh, leveraging transportation. So although the transport of things is likely to significantly increase, all right? So the picture at the bottom here, right, uh, is becoming common in my neighborhoods. Um, uh, nevertheless, I think the reduction in the transport of people is likely to more than offset it. Um, so those are two, uh, two of these trends I wanted to mention. Uh, the third trend is around really cities and the future of cities. So uh, cities, you can think of them as a solution to, the in, to this problem of how to efficiently provide products and services to a large number of people. All right, and the solution is proximity, right? Uh, so cities offer proximity to work, schools, hospitals, retail, entertainment, and so on. And they also leverage density. So it feeds on itself in that sense. Uh, because of the two uh, previous forces, force one and force two I just mentioned, both geographic uh, proximity and density are likely to increasingly matter less. Notwithstanding sort of some of the, um, I, I, I think, um, um, some, of, some of these immediate effects of the pandemic, the, the, the direction is, I think, in, headed in that way. And then over time, the net effect may be diminished importance of cities as hubs for the delivery of products and services, resulting in new patterns of land use of travel. We're seeing a little bit of that in, um, in super dense cities like New York and San Francisco, where it has been a shift away from the cities. Um, and um, some are calling it an exodus from the cities. Um, now, the cities could retain their attraction just because of the, of the utility people derive from density, the social aspect of being uh, part of large groups, potentially attractive to young people, for example. And then the fourth force uh, is the emergence of businesses and business models that provide on-demand access to product and services. Okay, so this is providing things when needed, where needed, um, uh, and in the map needed. And this is increasingly obviating the need to own stuff. So instead of renting stuff on a short-term basis or accessing stuff on a short-term basis, and right, the, the, uh, for transportation, the most relevant one is mobility on demand. Right, the Uber, Lyft, and other on-demand uh, shared mobility systems. Um, here, um, a, a side comment that while the mobility on-demand is so, I, I, not, notwithstanding the fact that during the pandemic, uh, the usage of Uber and Lyft has has reduced, and uh, 
Uh, I think the mobility, the idea of mobility on demand is here to stay, um, but also on demand in general. Um, so um, this could reduce the number of vehicles owned and the amount of stuff we own. It's not entirely clear whether it will reduce necessarily usage. So it, not necessarily true. It could reduce total miles traveled just because of expanded access. And we, uh, um, uh, for example, in cities like New York, there actually um, there has been a growth in, in vehicle miles traveled as well as uh, traffic congestion as well as siphoning off demand from public transit. Um, automated vehicles uh, is the other thing on the horizon that could accelerate the shift to mobility on demand and further reduce the need for car ownership. Um, automated vehicles could also amplify the magnitude of the other forces I mentioned at play, particularly enabling more transportation enabled services so that this vehicle could now become much more than a, a, a driverless car, become more than just a car for transporting people, but increasingly leverage to transport stuff. And then the diminished role of cities as hubs for the efficient delivery of products and services. Um, so in summary, um, the, I think the pandemic has given us a glimpse of a perhaps not too distant a future of what I'm calling here the transportation light economy uh, that will be increasingly technology driven on demand and automated. And um, I think over the next decade, uh, right, this may call for rethinking of, uh, of government um, uh, spending on transportation infrastructure. What is transportation infrastructure? We may have to think that, rethink that. Uh, public transit, um, uh, Yingling alluded to um, the, 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 the redefining of pub, uh, public transit, and then how transportation is regulated, particularly as these new modes of transportation really are, are um, their business model is very different. For example, they rely on crowdsourcing in some aspects and peer-to-peer -peer interactions uh, and so on. So with that, I will stop. And this is perhaps an um, illustration of our future, very few cars supporting many, many people, <laughs> all jammed up. Um, uh, yeah, happy to uh, answer questions, uh, but also your comments, uh, your uh, suggestion, your pushback. And if you're interested in um, in, in our work, please uh, please email me or um, or check out some of uh, these websites. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. That was very thought provoking, and uh, uh, I, I think we will have some uh, comments and questions. I already have one from Representative Elkins. Representative Elkins. Hi. So one of the things that I've uh, been noticing as Uber and Lyft have, uh, have taken off is that they're a much more attractive service, much more widely used in, in denser places. So here in the Twin Cities, for example, um, I, I live in, in Bloomington, just off the, uh, the Bloomington Strip, which is, has more hotel rooms uh, than St. Paul and Minneapolis combined. And so I, I never have, you know, trouble, you know, summoning uh, an Uber and a Lyft. I don't think I've ever had to wait more than 10, 10 minutes for a vehicle to arrive. But you know, notice that friends who live in more distant suburbs, um, frequently the, the service just isn't available at all. And I think a large part that's because the drivers don't want to be out there because the density of rides just isn't there. I see that as a trend that, that it, as we move into greater sharing, uh, more autonomy and whatnot is only likely to intensify and um, perhaps offset some of the trends that you're just uh, discussing that uh, would have the countervailing effect of dispersing uh, you know, population more. Uh, I, I think, you know, based on what I'm seeing so far, it appears to me that the growth in shared mobility is going to enhance the, uh, the attractiveness of more dense places. Uh, Professor Ben Jafar, uh, uh, response to Representative Elkins. Um, um, uh, th thank you, Representative Elkins. That's an excellent observation. Yes, a lot of these um, um, shared mobility systems, right? They they have to take advantage of this network effect. Having more demand encourages more supply because you have more drivers, and having more supply also induces more demand because you're now you, you know that the service is reliable and so on. So they need that feedback. They need thick market on both sides of that market. Yeah. Um, I, um, um, I, I think automated vehicles, when the day comes and they become viable, may solve part of the problem. 
uh, because now uh, the automated vehicles are, uh, they don't have that agency that drivers do. Yeah. Um, the operator, the service provider, right, could mandate that they could allocate um, um, some capacity to, to areas and can control how they, that matching happens and where the vehicles go after they drop somebody off. So, um, but, but yes, it is, it is a challenge to doing on-demand mobility when the demand is, is when the, when the market yeah. is relatively thin. Yes. The, the, the other thing that I think I'm seeing is that I think a, a lot of analysts are, are underestimating the, uh, the impact of deadheading costs in less, des less dense places. I had a conversation with an ex-urban mayor recently where he said, well, why, well, you know, why would I want to use public transportation that exists today when I can summon an, a, a driverless Uber and Lyft and have a car at my door at five, in five minutes? And I had to explain to you that it, you know, it's, it's going to be a lot more than five minutes to get to a, get a car to your house. And the, the company is going to want to charge you for the, uh, the, the, the cost of driving the car out to your house empty It'll, for a long distance. Good observation, Representative Elkins. We will take Representative Petersburg's question and then move on to our, our last speaker. Uh, Representative, P Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, and I'll be very quick again. Uh, so earlier in your presentation, you had a slide in which it said transportation was a solution to spatial mismatch between people and services. And I might kind of remind us back to 1900s when that mismatch wasn't occurred. And the fact is that Transportation actually allowed that mismatch to grow uh, because of the convenience of, of that piece. But my question for you is, as transportation becomes more on demand, usually that on demand comes with a higher cost. Do you see that as creating a, another barrier for low income who may not be able to afford that additional cost? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Ben Jafar. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Representative Peter, uh, Petersburg. Uh, that's an excellent um, observation. Yeah, both of, both of those observations right are right, are right on target. Um, the question is about cost. Again, it all depends on, on scale, right? If the scale is there, on-demand could become viable uh, and could become cheap. Um, um, uh, um, um, so the the biggest um, uh, right the the biggest challenge for for on demand at least in the mobility space is that it relies on um, on crowdsourcing, and uh, um, um, that's a, that's an unreliable source of supply for the for the service providers like Uber and Lyft. Uh, this perhaps explains the interest of the likes of Uber and Lyft in the, this automated technology. Uh, where they could bring to bear economies of scale that they struggle with now. And they have now to resort to pricing, right? Um, search pricing and so on to do that matching of supply and demand. The question about equity, I think is, uh, is also on target um, and not because of uh, uh, pricing, but also because of access. Currently, um, uh, some communities do not have access to the reliable internet, mobile phones and uh, they're, they're underbanked or they don't have access to credit cards. So, so there's a lot of barriers and we have to be mindful. And this is perhaps the role of, 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 uh, of government here is to make sure that these services do not leave uh, a segment of the population behind. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, uh, Professor Benjafar. And um, we appreciate your time and uh, in your research, and again, if, if there are, there may be some additional questions for you, and we will we will pass those on. So thank you so much. Uh, and so our last uh, presentation for the afternoon, uh, we're very happy to um, welcome Professor Shashi Shekhar. Uh, he is with the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Minnesota, and is doing a lot of work on. Uh, the role of data and how we um, collect and manage data as uh, important as that is for our uh, both academic research and for our, our public policy discussions here at the Capitol. Uh, so Professor Shakar, welcome to the committee uh, and please state you. your name for the record. Sure, let me just do that. So my uh, name is Shashi Jaker and I'll just show the slide as well so you can get the spelling. Uh, yeah, go ahead, please. Okay, you can proceed, uh, Professor Shaker. Okay, great. 
So, uh, so today, you know, I wanted to take a big data science perspective, and actually, it is opening up a large number of economic opportunities, including some of the things we heard before. For example, the sharing economy will not be possible without having a good data infrastructure. So, um, so first, I'll give you, you know, my bias. So I come from um, a world where we look at you know, GIS, GPS, maps, and so on. Here is a book I recently wrote with MIT Press for a very broad audience, because this world has changed our life in a dramatic way in, in this century. And it's a silent revolution. You don't see a lot of media talk about it, but the impact is much, much bigger than everything you have heard so far today. And here are my some academic writings from before. So I will take you to this world and I will also show you what insights it gives you about transportation and the COVID-19 impacts on transportation. So I also wanted to acknowledge a number of colleagues. You know, our recent work on COVID-19 impacts on transportation was actually initiated by request from Metropolitan Council, MinDOT, MMB, and so on. And it came to us through uh, CTS. And uh, that prompted us to look at this very, very new data set called SafeGraph COVID-19 Consortium data set uh, in collaboration with MIT Media Lab. I also wanted to thank some of the students in my group who have actually created some of the plots and the sponsorship from National Science Foundation over recent year. We have one of the largest smart city grants in the country, that's this last one. But we also have grants on COVID-19 and transportation and so on, and a related grant from Department of Energy. So let me first quickly give you a, a gist of what this data set is. So uh, this data set is like a census of smartphones. So some of the applications that run on smartphone, they report locations. Uh, so for example, in Minnesota, you can see about 6% uh, of the population is represented in this data set. But if I look at it geographically, the coverage is fairly large. You know, almost all census block groups are represented. And it also gives us uh, you know, business information. So we can look at business categories. And here it is showing you the locations, you know, the business or points of interest about which we can get data. Now also right off the bat, I want to uh, mention that there are no privacy concerns here. This is very much like a census. They only report aggregate data and they use a state of the art privacy protection called differential privacy, which the latest census is also using. And it adds noise to make it even more difficult. You know? So theoretically and mathematically, you know, it, it has been shown that you cannot infer individual information if you are using these techniques. Now this has multiple data sets and I'm going to use uh, two data sets from here, social distancing and weekly pattern, and I will show you some of the insight from there. So let's start with social distancing data. And it actually reports average uh, travel distance by census block group. And it basically shows that we, you know, we are about 20% below pre-pandemic level. And here is some detail. Right? So this is, I'm showing you week by week, the red line is Twin Cities and the dashed blue line is Minnesota. Uh, but both cases you see pre level was higher. It dropped during stay at home order and it hasn't recovered fully, still about 20% down according to this data set. So amount, amount of our uh, distance travel per day is about 20% down. And here is some more detail if you wanted to uh, you know, look at the technical part. Now you may ask, why should I uh, trust this data, right? I don't know the sampling bias. I don't know each of the 6% of population you are monitoring and so on. And these are sent, you know, very important question and I will come back to it at the end of the talk. But for now, you know, we have been working with a number of, as I said, the Metropolitan Council, MMB, and, and they seem to trust it. And here is one reason why. So we tried to compare the data from MinDOT uh, traffic, you know, freeway traffic loop detectors, and we find the trends are very similar. So if you look at loop detector data in, you know, about 4,000 loop detectors on our Twin City freeways, it's about same 20% down from pre-pandemic level. You know. uh, and, and as I said, you know, we, we have been working these with uh, these colleagues since roughly March. With every other week, we provide summary data to MMB, and they have been looking at this data as they make policy decisions about whether people are complying with different COVID-19 interventions, or you know whether they sh you know whether should they should be taking more decisions to um, to control the disease and so on. And I'll show you a few examples of that. So, for example, here is uh, some insights about grocery store. Our first speaker mentioned that, but he did not show much data. 
Now, grocery stores have very high number of visits, but interestingly, those are all short visits, and this may surprise some of us. So you see the red line. This is quite an amazing thing, and it happened, you know, started to happen even before the pandemic. So like the pickup and delivery part has picked up a lot in grocery stores. You don't see very many long visits. So fewer people are going and doing the grocery there, you know, and staying more than 20 minutes. Uh, so again, you know, around, you just say this is the pandemic. Uh, stay at home order, it went down a little bit, but not much because this is an essential service, right? Let me take you to another place where you would actually see a surprise. And this is um, the restaurant. Everybody in the country thinks restaurant visits are down, but this data set gives you a very interesting insight that all restaurants are not the same. The full service restaurant, limited service restaurant are seeing very different trends. So in case of full service restaurant, you see a lot more long visits, whereas limited service is mostly short visits, pick up delivery. And when you look at the impact, in case of limited service, notice that it almost all recovered, right? I mean, the change is very small. But in case of full service restaurant, the change is dramatic. This is something missed by almost all national media and all researchers. But looking at this fine grained data, you can start to separate and drill down and get better insights. Let me show you a surprise. Again, almost nobody I, I, I know who has reported it. There were business categories where actually visits went up even during the shutdown. And here is one, hardware store. So look at pre-pandemic, right? And, and now I'm coming to the shutdown. And actually in Minnesota, hardware visits actually went up. Fortunately, most of them are short visits, so not every high risky place. Uh, but you know, maybe when we had more stay at home time, we could you know start our spring and summer projects. Right? So there are a lot of insights like that, and you know, I could show you many other. You know, we have analyzed airport and you know all kinds of details. Uh, you know where people are going and so on. Uh, time remaining, I will show you airport. Certainly, the passenger visits are way down. But one of the things you may have seen in New York Times yesterday, the freight is way up. In fact, Amazon Air and so on, they are building a lot of airport capacity. And it is one thing we should consider if your committee does oversee airport part, you should think about encouraging MSP2 to in increase its, um, its freight operations. You know, Cincinnati and many places, they are doing that. Okay? Here are some other things, the traffic safety. Even though traffic volume is down, uh, the severe you know, accidents actually are up. Right? So 20% jump in accident. And you will also, you know, you probably saw that a little bit from the police and so on. Major speeding is up, you know, uh, driving under influence is up and so on, right? So not everything is hunky-dory. Just because people are moving less doesn't mean they are moving safely. I and mean, there are behaviors that need to be discouraged. Right? Uh, here is another one, which was very expected. We all know that emissions went down because we are traveling less distance. And this thing from New York Times yesterday, and it kind of these numbers match, uh, you know, the numbers we showed you very well, right? So 20% down individual travel. However, the commercial travel has gone up. So roughly 15% is the, you know, reduction in emission, right? So this is, you know, yesterday. Uh, and, but people think, you know, by next year, once the recovery happens, all that will vanish. And transportation is about 15%. Now, I do want to bring up a public-private opportunity, which is, you know, with, to leveraging the new data. You know, this 15% that we got from COVID-19, we can get even higher just by exploiting the data. And here is one project, you know, we have been working on this for a few years, and I will show you the field test and so on. So, so you know, some of, so let me uh, remind you of the navigation apps like Google Map, Apple Map. Today, when you go there, they only give you routes based on travel time or distance. But now we have new data sets which allow you to ask for routes which minimize energy consumption or emission. In fact, uh, you start to see Uber already giving this option. So when you call an Uber ride, you can ask for a green ride and they will direct us to the zero emission vehicles, right? But you can do that for every vehicle. And, uh, and it is because of this new data set and I will just show you an example. So we had a big project, you know, working with uh, UPS, you know, hundreds of their electric, hybrid electric trucks. And this is, you know, a workhorse engine. And we are showing you in Cincinnati area two routes. Let's say you're starting from the left bottom. You're going to top right, which is the engine manufacturer's uh, headquarter. And here are two routes. You know, and notice the energy consumption difference. It's way more than 15%. So just by route choice, we can give you far better than 15% reduction. In fact, the DOE project, ARPA E, we were part of, their goal was 20% reduction. And there were, you know, 10 or 12 different projects. 
So, so there are new data sets, your vehicle onboard diagnostic. This is the data that's being used by insurance to, to give you driving discount. But this data is much richer. You can see the energy use, you can see emission. And if you exploit the data in route choices, you can do far better than what COVID-19 gave us for a year or two. And that I think is a great public-private partnership opportunity, PPO, because a lot of this data is owned privately. But the encouragement for energy reduction and so on would come from the government initiative. And you know, all sectors have to come together. If you are in more into the, the academic or, or technical detail, here is a paper that we published summarizing the results of ARPA E USDOE project. But broadly, this data set has a lot of value. You know, in fact, some of us may not realize this GPS that helps us navigate every day today also serves as the clock. So if you know, if you think about anything, telecommunication, internet, you know, power grid, all the clocks, they run on GPS. If the GPS goes down, a lot of disruption can happen. And, uh, you know, in fact, President Trump, you know, signed a bill to create a backup for GPS, because just in case of the disruption. Uh, but this also generates a lot of data, which is extremely valuable. And I'll just show you a projection from about 10 years ago, from the beginning of big data revolution, from McKinsey Global Institute, estimated a value of 600 billion annually. And this was in 10 years ago, and some of that is being realized. And, and there are other data sets. So this is a place we, you know, if we are interested in the economic development of Minnesota and intersecting transportation, we should pay attention. And even broader, you know, uh, Shaif mentioned about the self-driving car and, and connected car. So the future of transportation would be more connected, more technology. And here is a group called Autonomy, which has now partnership in 15 um, you know, cities. And they are looking for public-private partnership. Again, this infrastructure has to involve both because you know, the cell phone and a lot of these communication structure is private. Data will be private. But the government has to make sure that things are fair and accountable and so on. Also, we may new, need new infrastructure. So as I told you, GPS may not be enough. You may need more high-precision positioning and navigation infrastructure on the road to guide this connected and self-driving car. So, so we have been actually building national leadership and a community around that. We conducted an NSF workshop about a year and a half ago, and we are going to have another workshop in about a month and a half. And this is an invitation. If any of you are interested, please let us know. And this workshop is to engage the industry in, in this uh, effort. So, you know, the pandemic has shown you a great value from spatial data. And, uh, you know, there are many other opportunities ahead, like eco-navigation and eco-routing. And you know, the broadly, Internet of Things for smart you know, transportation would be a big thing. Uh, there are a lot of policy needs. You know, fairness, accountability, transparency, and ethics is not natural to all the, you know, the private players. And government has to play a role here. So going back to the data quality issue, so SafeGraph, you know, there are many other vendors, actually Streetlight and so on. And they all tell you that we have this big data, but they never tell us what's the sampling rate, you know, what's the coverage. And as we have analyzed the safe craft data, we have you know, developed some insight. But this is a place we really need a, a government leadership to encourage transparency of data quality. And that will really help us op open up the value. Great. So with this, you know, I'll wrap up uh, my comments and uh, see if there are any questions. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Shaker. And uh, I, I appreciate the, I, I was looking carefully at your um, uh, navigation app st uh, study in Cincinnati, which is my hometown. Uh, it okay. didn't seem like I looked at the map, it didn't seem like that study was near the house I grew up in, but uh, I'm glad that my hometown was able to provide you with some important research data. Um, members, we have uh, about seven minutes or so for questions. I'm happy to take uh, your questions. Um, don't see anyone yet. Uh, We'll wait a minute or two here. Right. Hello? I just wanted to mention. Yes. Uh, Representative Hornstein, did you hear about the big Amazon Air, you know, investment in Cincinnati Airport? No, but cargo not, until, not until you uh, uh, mentioned that. And, you know, the airport has been a bit underutilized since, um, you know, it was formerly a hub for Delta. And uh, right. Delta, when, the, when they merged with Northwest, sort of moved their hubs around. So I think there is a lot of underutilized space there. So I'll, I'll look for Amazon planes the next time I'm there. Yeah. Um, Representative Elkins. Yeah, I, I just wanted to mention that um, 
Uh, Professor Shekhar, I, I am very interested in transportation and data, so I, I took down your email address and I'll just I'll reach out to you directly to communicate with you offline. Great, great, thank you. Um, yes, and um, Representative Elkins is doing a number of uh, bills on that topic, so the, um, your presentation was very timely. Um, are there any other questions of the committee? Uh, so let me maybe trigger one controversial thing, maybe you know, following um, Ben's thing. So in the vehicle world, in our national workshop, actually four trends came up. You know, we heard about the shared vehicle here. We heard about self-driving vehicle here. But you know, the bigger trend is electric, electric vehicle. Right. And that's a place actually Minnesota doesn't seem to be keeping pace. In fact, you may have seen complaints about if people want to buy electric vehicles in Minnesota, it takes longer and, and dealers are not keeping enough. And there are big initiatives on the way. You probably saw Biden administration wants to put half million charging stations around the country. NSF has already funded electrifying roads kind of as a big project. So among the four trends, the biggest trend right now is electric vehicle. That's where all the you know, the money from industry is going. And, and by the way, the self-driving is sort of on the back ropes. Uber has actually left that business. So, so that's one other thing I just wanted to bring up. You know, I know in your next hearing, William Northrop will say a little more about it, but that's other place I really think, you know, Minnesota should think about encouraging adoption of electric vehicles. We'll have a question from Representative Cagle, but I, I did want to thank you for raising that. Um, I, I do think that uh, that is an important observation. Uh, you know, as we move forward, and we will be having a hearing on electric vehicles and um, and, and and how to fund that. Uh, you know, I think this General Motors um, uh, announcement recently about not, uh, you know, basically they're going to be all electric after you know 2025. I think is a huge development, and and uh, you know we're going to have to be really building infrastructure very quickly. Uh, in order to keep up with that reality. The last word, last question from the committee from Vice Chair Cagle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I was really excited when I saw that GM announcement because um, they also have batteries that will be able to, uh, the range of about 450 miles. So that's pretty exciting. But one of the things that I've been thinking about um, as I'm sitting here in my living room in this um, you know, Zoom hearing is, um, delivery services and how much of an impact that's having on our roads, uh, not only UPS and FedEx, uh, but you know the Instacart and Amazon. Um, and just wondering how much stress that's putting um, on the transportation system and um, what your thoughts are about how, um, how you so, know, how, so how they great, can yeah. pay in a little bit more to the sure. system. Sure. So this is a great question. And actually, we were looking to all the transportation business codes in uh, SafeGraph data last week after conversation, you know, about in preparation of this. Now, unfortunately, SafeGraph data did not have coverage of many of the business codes. So we could not, you know, we looked at the category, but there wasn't enough data for us to make a substantial comment. But the closest thing I saw, and if you like, you know, yesterday's New York Times article, I took the excerpt as well. But at least the air cargo space, they are saying that the e-commerce related air cargo growth rate has accelerated quite a bit. And if you want, I can show you the number in a slide now, or I can send you the article. So, well, let's so that part, uh, Just one second, Professor. We'll, um, if you want to wrap up, and then I, I think that uh, Professor Ben Jafar had a quick observation, and then we'll, uh, we'll adjourn our meeting. So just uh, proceed if you can quickly, and then we'll have uh, Professor Ben Jafar. Okay, so if you don't mind, I will share the screen one quick time because I had an excerpt from that article, which may be of interest. And that maybe is a proxy for what, you know, what is happening in, on the road as well. So let me, so are we able to see this slide? Yes. Uh, so, yeah, and okay. this is an important, we, we will we'll be hearing from the airport next week, a week from today, and we'll right. keep in mind your, your air cargo observations and ask them that question yeah but but notice that what they're saying is you know the the target they are thinking that it will go from 12 million tons to 45 million tons you know by mid-century but pandemic has moved it one decade earlier so now it's by 2040 
So in roughly 20 years, the air cargo is going four times because of e-commerce. So, so that I would say is the closest data set I have. And uh, you know, what it probably means is also that you know, door-to-door -door delivery is going up, but I do not have a data set. I mean, this is something, this is where public-private partnership is very important. The UPS, FedEx, and Amazon probably have this data, and I haven't seen a lot in public. We'll, we'll see if we can get that. Uh, Professor Benjafar, I see you have your hand up, and if you have one last uh, yeah, yeah. parting yeah. words for us, that would be great. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Hornstein. Yeah, it, it, just a couple of quick remarks. One is the point about uh, a lot of these uh, delivery services, in a sense, free riding on public infrastructure is a very good one. And I, I, I think in terms of uh, um, the, the, um, this public, uh, the road infrastructure has enabled uh, uh, these business models. And uh, um, in some sense, these uh, service providers haven't paid their fair share of that. Um, so I, I think one has to rethink a little bit um, the, um, how they contribute to, um, um, to our to the public infrastructure that is um, core to their business uh, business model. The the other uh, the other quick uh, point is uh, about uh, electric vehicles and uh, what's happening in Minnesota. And just here a quick plug for our car. So I sit on the board of uh, for full disclosure. I sit on the board of our car. Um, uh, our car is a local car sharing organization here in, in um, uh, based in St. Paul, and they uh, about to launch an all electric vehicle. Uh, service one way in partnership with the city of, of St. Paul and Minneapolis uh, and Excel Energy uh, with funding from the government, uh, from uh, the federal government. And um, super excited about, uh, about that. I think it's an, an example of how these uh, public private pr uh, partnerships could happen, but also maybe, um, maybe um, a sense of how uh, that, that, that electric future uh, might look like. Well, thank you for that. We will hear, I think, from our car yeah. later. And uh, I'm sorry, uh, Professor. May we I mention one, one we last. We'll have to wrap up one very, very quickly. If you have one final. Sure, sure. sure. I just wanted to mention this smart and connected communities or smart cities is another place we should pay attention to. The transportation secretary nominee was one of the, you know, he had one of the project in the same program. And I believe he's going to up the funding substantially. And it will be a good way for Minnesota to bring in new technologies and modernize our, our roadways. Excellent. Well, thank you, both of you. Uh, thank you to the committee. And again, please uh, funnel your questions over to uh, Mr. Howe, and uh, he will get them to our speakers. Uh, this really was a fantastic afternoon. I think that we, you know, the, the charge here was to talk about COVID and the future of transportation. I think many thought-provoking presentations to, to guide us in our work. So to everybody, thank you very much. This meeting is adjourned. We will have part two of our uh, Center for Transportation Studies uh, discussion on uh, our next meeting, which is Tuesday, January 19th at 1 p.m. And with that, this meeting is adjourned.